this has been a really hard thing for the church to struggle with, right? Uh, I want to bring up some slides here um, that I found interesting. We're not going to go real in depth on a lot of these, but uh, let's just look at these. Uh, the, over here, it says apologetics, which is kind of a, the way that people have argued for the faith in the past. The first slide says, orthodox, heretical, who cares? Let's find some common ground, right? This is actually uh, kind of coming from a, mo a church that's embraced modernism, right? And they're being critical of churches that are seeking to engage in this new culture. The bottom slide comes from a church movement that's saying, you know, we want to ex explore what, what it means to, to be God's presence in this world. And so it talks about apologetics is live your faith, share your life. What's interesting to me about the first one is it's basically criticizing the attitude that says, orthodox, radical, who cares? Let's find common ground. It's saying, you know, things aren't important. We need to know, is it right or is it wrong? Or the atonement about how God meets us, how God redeems us. The first slide says, we all, all we have are theories anyway, so why not make a toy out of it? They're saying, you know what, if, if you don't, if you question it, you're making a toy out of it. The bottom one says atonement. While we were yet sinners, Jesus overcame evil with love. <coughs> or authenticity. I'm tired of having to pretend I'm not crazy. <laughs> Although I kind of resonate with that a little bit. You know? um, I think it's, you know, it's criticizing and saying, you know what, you may be authentic, but something's wrong with you, right? Where this is saying authenticity, authenticity, we are all broken icons, you know, that understand that, you know what, there isn't anyone that's perfect. Click the next one, just to get a little more, I, I like the certainty. Of course I'm sure about something, I never question my own doubts. Bottom one, certainty, well-guarded doctrine. I think in many ways, this middle and the bottom is what the church had been. We, we, we put up these fences, we lock it in, we said, we understand it all, and no one questions it. And the new movement within the church is saying, you know what? Maybe we don't have a handle on everything. Maybe doubts are okay. It doesn't mean that there isn't something that's true. But let's stop pretending we have everything and we know all of it. Right? Um, I'm going to skip through the rest of these, probably because of time, but you can look at these down the future. Uh, down the road is very interesting. But go to the last slide of the good guys. There we go. Oh, bring it back. A little too quick. One, one too many. <laughs> the last slide talked about kingdom. It's the present reality of God shining through. Right? Saying that if culture has changed, we need to talk about how do we deal with culture. And what happened in modernity in many ways is we went from a culture where the church was the culture. Right? Everybody was part of the church. It just wasn't the way it was. So culture and church were the same thing. Culture is kind of the way we experience reality. Right? Then, when modernity hit, the church began to kind of wrestle with this, and at first it didn't realize that the church became a subculture. It was its own little culture by the side, it didn't realize it had been forgotten, it thought it was still central, and it wasn't. When it came to realize it, it became what we call kind of countercultural. We said, we're not going to be like that culture, there's something wrong out there. Kind of like those top slides in the show, you know, we, we don't want to be anything like that, we resist that. We have our own culture, right? So now you have Christian TV, you have Christian radio, right? Uh, you can go to Only Christian Gatherings. In fact, you can get, like, The Shepherd's Guide. It's a book that you can go to only stores that are run by Christians. You can spend all your life and never have to deal with anybody but a Christian and have our own little culture, our own way of doing things, our own way of being. Right? Now, the thing is, when we look at the stories about Jesus, who we've centered our journeys in, you know, how did he deal with culture? And I think um, maybe a word that we use in our time would be a little more helpful, and that's cross-cultural. Say, so you know what? There are things about God uh, that, that are important, and our culture doesn't always embrace the things that are good, right? There are things they love about our culture, but let's be honest, are there things we look around us and say, you know, I don't know if that's really the best place to be. We need to wrestle with it and say, you know, but if we have something to share, we need to go and say, you know, if there are things in the way our community lives that are good, we say, that, that's God at work, and we embrace that. If there are things that are just not as helpful, we say, let's try and cross that, and maybe invite others to do it differently. And the kingdom mentality is saying the present reality of God shining through. That part of the idea that postmodernism uh, post embraces, and I think the church has forgotten is central to who God is, is that God is in everything. That everything is sacred. There is no secular and sacred. There's no separation. But God is in the midst of all things. We just often don't see it. And we want to open ourselves to see as God is shining through. Look at the next thing, quick, quick, guys. Um, we're, we're talking about, um, in this series we're doing this summer, the journey of faith, uh, this week, I'm sorry, is the journey of faith in modern in postmodern culture. I'm going to explore this just a little bit more before we finish. But the series is Reclaiming Jesus' Message for Everyone. And 
part of what we have to say is, you know, I think that, that this message Jesus brought has been kind of pulled to this place that, that only a certain few could experience. It's been kept in its own culture. And we want everyone to be able to hear something and much different, maybe, than they were told Jesus' message was. That Jesus' message has been twisted in many ways, and the church often has been at the heart of it because it's embracing things that maybe we shouldn't have. So we want to explore what does this message look like? Maybe it's something very different than we've been told, especially those of us who've been part of churches where we realize, you know what, that it was clear that there was something about us that we just didn't belong, and we really weren't sure, though, that that was what Jesus was about. Click on it. If you read in the, uh, the Gospels, the stories we hear about Jesus, and the, uh, the word actually means good news, about this good news that Jesus came to bring. In the first uh, uh, chapter of the, the Gospel of John, it says this. The word was first, right? Uh, the word is logos in, in Hebrew, so we're really into this, in some ways this intellectual place, right? Well, is that God calling? Right. It's for you. So, the word was first, say this, this logos, this this presence of God was first. You read the stories in Genesis when God creates the world, that God speaks, and it happens. So the word is central. So the word was first. The word present to God. God present to the word. Right? So we're talking very relational here, very connected. The word was God. Put God in there. The word was God. Also, in readiness for God from day one. So this word is in relation to God, yet the word is also God. Um, does this sound like something that we can measure or, you know, kind of define the sentence? much what we call mystical. It's things that seem like it can be, and it's true, and it's beyond us, but yet there's something deeply real there. Next one. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without him. So say this, this word that was in the beginning, that's connected to God and, and is God, was there in the beginning, making everything it is. And then, oh, the next one, guys, here we go. I'm to work on our signal. What came into existence was life, and the life was life to live by. And you know that, that we who, who haven't been able to see that God is already there in the midst of things, that this God's word, this presence of God came into existence, and it was life. It was, what, what was real life, and it came to give us life to live by, to help set us free. And this is a very important verse. And that life, life blazed out of the darkness. The darkness couldn't put it out. So it's always there, and it can't be stopped. It's, it's always there for us to see. And one more. And the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Right? I'm going to stop it. Hold that right there for a second. I love it. It became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. The literal translation is pitched its, its tent among us. Right? Um, have you ever heard the word incarnation or incarnational? Right? Incarnation is when we talk about Jesus becoming human. If you know Spanish, it's a little helpful. In means in. But carne, you know what carne is? Flesh. It actually can be meat too. It just doesn't sound as pretty that way. But it's pretty real then that, that this living presence of God became flesh, became meat, became flesh and blood like us. And you could touch and feel and pitched his tent among us, came down to be with us. And listen to this. The writer says, We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like, like, thank you, like Father, like Son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. What's interesting to me is it's saying, you know, not that. And we measured it and said, but we experienced it like love. You know, to love your father. Like, we met him. We, we were with him. We experienced what he was like. And we saw that who he was came from God. And it's something that we want. You know, if we're going to talk about this change in culture, is people of faith, we need to realize that God is already out there. And that we can touch God and meet God. And, and we, are, we need to be like God's living presence in the world. Not just in this a Sunday time gathering, which is kind of where church became you know, relegated to. We had its own special building. It's own special day, and that one hour of the week and everything else, you know, was separate. Saying God is already out there in the midst of all this. If we want to be about it, we need to be out there too. In fact, what's really interesting is in Luke, um, early on in the Gospel of Luke, uh, another story about Jesus. When Jesus is grown and he goes and makes his first public appearance to bring this message, this, this good news of what he's about in the world, it says that he returned to Galilee, which is his home area, powerful in the spirit. And news that he was back spread through the, through the, the countryside. And he taught in their meeting places to everyone's acclaim and pleasure. So everybody loved hearing him, right? Keep going, guys. Let me finish going. He came to Nazareth, where he had been reared. This is where he grew up, where he was from. And as he always did on the Sabbath, the, their worship day, he went to the meeting place, and when he stood up to read, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. This is before the whole book revolution thing, like the first 
to you, right? <laughs> and I'm rolling the scroll, which took a little while because he didn't have that nice handy book. He found the place where it was written. God's spirit is on me. And this is this is an experience. God's spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. He sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burden and battered free, to announce this is God's year to act. And he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the assistant, and sat down, and every eye in the place was on him intent. And he started in, saying, you've just heard scripture made history. It came through just now in this place. Right here, right now in this place, this has happened. It's true. God has come down. And what's God concerned about? The poor, the blind, the lame, those who have been in prison, those who are chained. And it's not just talking literally in prison, although it is, but those who have been oppressed and held in place. You know, is there anyone you know that doesn't in some way feel like they're being held in this place of bondage? And the message that God came to bring that we hear through Jesus, that we experience is that God is about this world and setting people free from here and now. Uh, there's a quote, I want to read, read this, and I'm going to see if you guys can guess where this might come from. Next one. Salvation is the entire universe being brought back into harmony with its maker. This has huge implications for how people present the message of Jesus. Yes, Jesus can come into our hearts, but we can join a movement that is as wide and as big as the universe itself. Rocks and trees and birds and swamps and ecosystems, God is up. God's desire is to restore all of it. For Jesus, the question wasn't, how do I get into heaven, but how do I bring heaven here? The goal isn't escaping this world, but making this world the kind of place God can come to. And God is remaking us to the kind of people who can do this kind of work. Anybody know who that's from? This guy named Rob Bell. Oh. Anybody ever heard of Rob Bell? Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> you know, um, I think this is a huge change for us in our culture, but it's not a huge change God. This is what, if you read the scriptures without all the lenses we've been given, this is what we hear over and over is that, yeah, well, God is concerned about the hereafter. God is very much concerned about the here and now, about this world, and not just us as people, but the whole of creation, and about setting it free, and that God wants us to be a part of it. That the church isn't the central thing for God, it's this whole world and the mission God has in the world. And He doesn't want us to come together and be like members of this official church to be, I'm a member of Spirit of Hope. That God wants us to be a movement, a movement. Know, for changing things for the better, to, to share what God is about in the world. And this is what we want to explore in the coming weeks, to say, you know, if we want to be a movement, we need to be something different. It's not just, you know what, you have to be here on Sunday, and this is the only kind of faith community you can be a part of. You know what, if there are things that, that help you in your journey with God, that's where you do it. You know, Bridget has just taken classes in another church to help her explore her own gifts, of, of visions and dreams. You know, some of us need to find things other places. It's, it's kind of like... Um, movie, uh, Why I Married You, they talk about the 80-20 rule, that even in marriage, the best best, best marriage, the other person's only going to give you 80% of what you need, you know, there's another 20. And you might go looking for the other 20 elsewhere, and when you find it, you know what, you lose the 80 and you're stuck with the 20, right? Okay. You know, <laughs> this movement we want to be about is not a place to join, but about a movement of, of being about God's, uh, God's intentions for the world, about helping this world become what God intended to be. But if there are other things you find out there that help you in it, that's great, because God's already out there in other places and other people. You know, it doesn't mean you have to leave or come or you know, only be part of one, that all of this is God's movement. So what we want to explore is if, if uh, this is what God is about, then what we should look like in this movement is a little different.